Welcome to the Human Out Loud podcast, where people share personal stories and experiences in the hopes of creating a more connected world through vulnerability, honesty, and humility. I'm your host, Elise, and today I'll be talking with Dan, a creative consultant and natural philosopher about ego. We'll take a look at how Dan defines ego, his relationship with this concept, and seven tips for overcoming ego's hold on you. Without further delay, here's Dan. I sort of, it's always challenging to put concepts that you have in your head into words that make sense for other people. Um, It's sort of like, yeah, describing a color to like someone who's colorblind or something like that. But the way that I think about ego is that, you know, and I've read different things from different authors about, you know, killing your ego or on the other side of the spectrum, your ego's gone wild. It's off the charts, the other direction. But I'm, I don't know, my life is sort of all about balance. So I don't, I think we need a little bit of ego, but again, we, it can still get out of control, but My definition of ego is sort of, if we could take a step back from that, the way that I sort of look at life is that we have sort of a a duality. We have our bodies, which are here, but there's also like another part of ourselves that's connected to something larger. And... um, that other thing i sort of call it the beyond because we have our body and then we have the beyond part of ourselves and our bodies are finite as we know Um, nobody lives forever but the beyond part is infinite and um so our ego i think at least the way i look at it is our ego helps keep our bodies alive at the very least. Like that's part of its job. Like one example, an easy example is like, you know, we all have basic needs to keep our bodies alive and functioning. One of them is we have to eat food and drink water. So um, if we had no ego at all, you know, we'd just be giving away all our food and water to people who we thought were more deserving of it, or we thought needed it more than we did. And then, you know, after a couple weeks of no food and water, our body (laughs) wouldn't exist anymore. So if that makes any sense, I don't know. It's hard, again, it's hard to put this to words. (laughs) Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I get what you mean. I feel like anytime I read any sort of kind of concept when it comes to mindfulness, or, you know, when we're talking about ego or consciousness, I'll read how someone else phrases it. I'm like, I get this, they explained it, this makes sense. And I go to explain it to someone else. And I feel like Uh, rambling and mumbling. I'm like, Oh, my gosh, like, it seems like I didn't even read anything, because it's so jumbled up. And Um, So I I get what you mean, but I feel like you explained that really well. So for you, you know, I feel like, again, there's kind of a a couple of different ways that the concept of ego is introduced to us and and we can learn about it. At what stage of your life was this a concept that you were introduced to and felt like you started to actually get some form of understanding about what ego is to you? Again, that's hard. There's not like a moment I can go back to exactly. It's just sort of evolved over time but i will say i mean i in college i took a lot of philosophy courses and um world religion classes and things like that so i was introduced to different world views and different philosophies so i guess probably in my early 20s Excuse me, I ate too many tacos for lunch. (laughs) Sounds like a good problem to have. You know, when you eat, like, 
you have something that's like delicious and I don't know, maybe this has something to do with ego, but like, I just couldn't stop myself. I knew I should have stopped eating after my first taco, but it was so delicious. I had another taco and now I'm uncomfortable. Darn it. I literally did the same thing last night. Our My, my in-laws made this like cheesy noodle dinner thing and uh, driving to see them. We were on the road for a long time and I started eating. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize how hungry I was. So I ate way more of that than I usually do when they make it. And then, you know, of course that was kind of a late dinner. So then I get ready for bed and I was like, oh my gosh, this is stuck. <laughs> I can feel the, all this cheese stuck in my, in my stomach right now. It's the digestive tract is not, not functioning correctly right now. Um, so that's funny. I've been there very recently. I understand that really. <laughs> Um, so I guess for you, when you were taking those classes and kind of, you know, wherever you were at that point, um, of your life, when you were in your early twenties, do you feel like that really impacted you? I mean, is that, did you kind of change your way of living or your perspective on anything? Yeah. You know, I started slowly realizing that when I dialed back my ego like things just went more smoothly for me in my life like I was noticing I, I it's almost like it was an obstacle to success in a way um so I just noticed you know um if you dial it back and um get control of your ego that good things started to happen. So I just, you know, put two and two together and was like, okay, this must be the reason. So let me learn more about this. Let me stop, you know, like lessen my ego, make it smaller. And that was really just the start of it. There was actually a moment in my early 20s that I, I often think back to, and it was a time when I was just walking home. I grew up in the Chicago area, and I remember it pretty distinctly. It was a pretty cold night. It was winter, and I had to walk home from a friend's house um, because I couldn't get a ride, and I didn't have a warm enough jacket. so. I was just like, I was just walking. I'm like, all right, let me just walk and see what happens. You know, I don't think I'll freeze to death or anything. And it was a super crystal clear night, the kind of cold nights where there's no cloud cover to sort of hold in the day's heat or anything. So I was just walking home and looking up at the stars and just sort of just being really mindful about and just trying to listen to my body to see if it would give me signals like, you know, like if your extremities start going numb or something like that. So I was hyper aware of my body, but also the beyond stuff too that I was talking about. And I just was looking up at the stars and just this feeling came over me that sort of the only way I can describe it was it wasn't like an audible voice, but it was just something that said, everything's going to be OK. And I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I sort of just took that on as my sort of life philosophy is like, you know, you walk out of a bathroom and you have a piece of toilet paper stuck on the bottom of your shoe and somebody looks at you and laughs but you know what everything's going to be okay like who cares you know so it was very freeing that moment and that was if there's a moment i could look back on and think of you know where i started this mindfulness journey and this whole learning more about ego and the negative effects it can have on you I guess it would be that moment. When you were explaining that experience, uh, it kind of made me think back to some concepts that I've 
read about. So for you, do you feel like ego, while it does serve some purpose, do you feel like it's limiting in the sense that it's kind of what makes you feel separate from everything else in the world? Is that how you would explain it too? or? I think so. I'm sort of scanning through my notes that I put together beforehand for this um, interview. And let's see. The way, yeah, I'm going to try to circle back to my definition of ego again, but um, so there's somebody, I, I'm sure you've heard of Dr. Wayne Dyer before, author, has written many books on the topic of ego and, and, and different things. And so the way I think about ego is so pretty similar to the way he thinks about it in that it can be an obstacle in your life. Um, it, right, so the, like I was saying before, the ego, in my opinion, the ego is basically the voice for your human form, your human body, in a way. That's like, to me, that's the ego's job, is just to look out for your body. Um, so, you know, it the ego will tell you, like, the good things that you're doing, but it will also tell you about all your faults, but it'll also judge other people too. It'll start telling you like, oh, you're so much better than that person because this, this, and this. And gosh, so here's the concept. Um, I think like ego is very tricky. It's very a sneaky kind of character because even when I'm being my, trying to be my best self, my most mindful self, my ego will sneak in and be like, oh, Dan, you're doing the best job. You're so mindful. You are way more mindful than these other jerks out there. And I'm like, no, that's the exact opposite of what I'm trying to accomplish here. <laughs> yes, I definitely fall into that trap <laughs> myself. <laughs> I feel like, uh, I feel like I have kind of dialed back some of my mindfulness practices recently because I felt like, and this isn't a new experience or thing I've noticed, but I feel like I just really was more aware recently of how much I was judging myself based on how mindful I thought I was being or how much quote unquote progress I thought I was making. I'm like, this yeah. is not, no, like this is, I'm confident this is not the right angle. This is exactly, this is not really the opposite of what really mindfulness is all about, which of course, noticing it, that's, that's great. You know, that's just part of it, but it's so, so easy to have that ego sneak in and kind of take over, you know, something that has good intentions that ideally would help you be less judgmental and more open-minded. And then ego still swoops in somehow. Yeah, I think though, like you were saying, um, as you're trying to be a better person and more mindful, I think once, you know, ego sort of jumps in and tries to take over, if you, the more mindfulness practice you do, the more you're able to just sort of just say, okay, ego, I get it. You want to be noticed, but let's just put you back in your place, put you off to the side, you know, I don't need you right now. Um, and I think the more and more you're able to do that, the easier and easier it gets. Um, of course, there are people in the world, especially on like the world stage, who you can just look at them and you're like, oh my God, that person is 100% ego and nothing else. Like, <laughs> it's just, and so, but then again, while you're looking at that person, you're trying not to judge them for being like egotistical because then that's your ego 
like telling you that you're better than that other person. So it's very tricky. <laughs> it's very tricky, as will your edit of this will be very tricky. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's interesting you mentioned the, you know, looking at someone and then judging them for how egotistical they seem and realizing, well, now I'm judging and I'm comparing and now I'm being egotistical. The first thing I, I thought of, um, which this is kind of a different topic, but I feel like it kind of plays into some of these struggles here is, you know, kind of this non-judgmental awareness of trying to be, you know, accepting of people. And the first thing my brain jumped to was this concept of free will and how, uh, you know, Sam Harris is an author I really enjoy. And he actually has a book that talks specifically about free will and our lack of free will, um, you know, in the sense that that we, you know, um, would define free will as. And sort of saying, hey, you know, we can look at someone that does awful things and say, those are awful. This we need to find a way to help this person stop doing these things, but also not be so judgmental because we can realize that, you know, when a lion hunts down a gazelle, you know, they are, they don't know any differently. This is how they're programmed. This is what they're doing. So while we might say, oh my gosh, you know, this poor animal that they're hunting, like this is so, so awful. Um, you know, it's, you also can't blame the lion for just, doing it's you know what it what it does and so I think it's interesting to kind of not get super deep into that because I feel like oh that's like a very complicated topic but I feel like that does apply itself to you know this topic of ego and seeing people you know being egotistical or even judging ourselves for saying oh my gosh like I wish I could be more mindful or I wish I was less egotistical and say maybe give up some of that that control of the judgment or saying you know what that's this is just how it's naturally going to happen. This is going to come up um, and have some forgiveness there of, you know, understanding that we can't just fight this thing away. You know, we can't just wish it away. You know, it's, it's kind of a reality of, of how our brains and bodies work. Yeah, I think, I don't remember where I heard this, but I like, I liked this analogy. It's sort of similar to what you were saying in that we're all sort of, on our own individual paths and I mean we can't it would be silly to look at people who aren't as far along on the path to whatever the destination whatever we're calling it like our perfect self or whatever our highest self um it would be it's like it would be ridiculous to sort of see someone who's not far as far along on the path as we are and sort of judge them because it's like the analogy this person was talking about was like it would be the same as like being angry at a baby for being born and not being where as far along on the path as as I am now you know so you can that's sort of um, something I try to do is like look at people without judgment at all because everyone's at a different place along the path. Yeah, I that brought me back to a question I thought of earlier that then I forgot to ask. Um, you know, where we're talking about, I think kind of the first step is being aware of our ego and its role in our lives. And then kind of assessing, you know, if if the amount that it's expressing itself is necessary, or if we feel like it's limiting us or even being, you know, hurtful in some sense. Um, I guess whenever, just in terms of advice you'd give to anyone listening, you know, just based on the world we live in, I feel like there's so much opportunity for our egos to, <laughs> you know, come out and express themselves and... I think that's something that's really hard to escape, um, just kind of looking at the current state of our world and society and even access to technology uh, and, the, and the platforms that so many of us are using. I guess what... <laughs> what I know what you're saying. You're... For like a modern, like people living in modern society, you know, we read all these books from hundreds and thousands of years ago 
like, this is great advice, but things seem so much more complicated now, even though there's a lot of benefits to living, living now. I think there's also a lot of things that make it more difficult to focus on the mental health, even though physical health seems like it's so much more supported now. Mental health seems very difficult to achieve. Right. So I think doctors have come a long way as far as figuring out how to keep the body healthy and fit. But yeah, it's the beyond piece that no one really talks about because it's hard to talk about because it's hard to express. But yeah, I think I understand your question. And it's something that I think about all the time, really. And it's how does someone like me who's trying to manage their ego and almost err on the side of like, I'm always trying to lessen it whenever I can and find just the right amount. How does a person with a little bitty ego, or at least that's the goal, function in a society that's built on being as egotistical as possible? Like, and the, so, right. So that's the interesting thing. And so, um, I was just Googling this the other day. I'm sort of looking through. There's a lot, actually a lot of um, blogs and things about this topic. Even like I'm looking at an article on Inc.com and the title of the article is Six Ways to Start a Company Without Ego Getting in the Way. So it is something that people think about. Um, because you do feel almost, and maybe this is an ego thing, but you feel like you're walking into the world like sort of naked. You know, I'm trying to be a streamline, streamline my ego as much as possible. And then you walk into this world where you're supposed to brag about your accomplishments and show everybody, you know, buy the most expensive car you can afford and outwardly show all this, you know, wealth is important and all those things. So, I mean, that's, that's going to be an ongoing struggle. I would think for me, at least for the rest of my body's time on this planet is just, how can I fit in? How can I, not let my ego take over when, like you said, in this modern world, there's so many opportunities for that to happen. So, I mean, that's part of my practice is to keep my ego in check at all costs, just because as soon as I walk out my front door, <laughs> there's billboards, there's advertisements, there's I mean, you don't even have to walk outside. You could turn on your television. There's advertisements. There's reality shows. Like, reality shows. Like, that's just people with egos gone crazy. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the thing that makes money. That's the thing that the producers of those shows want to happen, is they put a handful of egotistical people in a room together, and then they just watch the fireworks explode. So, yes, it's very, it doesn't, and then again, you know, what I, I should say is these are all just, like, thoughts and feelings that I have that feel right for me, and I hope they're right. I mean, you'll never know for sure. Maybe after my body's gone and I, my beyond part goes back to the beyond, you know, maybe I'll get some answers then, but it just feels right for me to sort of keep my ego in check. And it feels strange to me that so many other people in the world don't even think about it or don't feel that it's necessary. And of course, you know, there are some 
people who think ego is a good thing and they should grow it as big as they can and don't try to tell them otherwise. <laughs> well, I think the interesting thing I, I just thought of as you mentioned that uh, is kind of tying ego. So, so I'm thinking back to some videos I watched talking about meditation and how, you know, when you meditate, the part of your brain that's actually, you know, very self-focused, uh, that part really quiets down. And that's that area also usually lights up when we're having anxiety, you know, when we're upset or, you know, we're, we're scared, kind of all of these things we would, all these feelings and states we would label as negative, you know, things we're trying to get away from, you know, I have to think the first thing I assume here is that our ego is kind of the driver behind a lot of these negative states. And so it's interesting that while I feel like our society has taken so many measures to distance ourselves from being uncomfortable, you know, we have access to so many things that are supposed to, have, you know, give us immediate satisfaction. It's a, they're supposed to distract us from all of these worries and troubles. But at the end of the day, it's just so interesting to me that I think we're kind of feeding the monster. You know, if we're feeding our egos and the need uh, and the need to always be comfortable and to always feel good about ourselves and to prove we're better, I feel like we're just inflating our our potential to be anxious, to be angry, to be scared. And we're leaving less and less space to be open and caring and you know all these other great things that of course tons of people have written about and every self-help book is about so it just blows my mind that I think we're all on the same page of what we want but the easy path there that you know it seems like all of this time and energy has gone into just in terms of sort of this like the very uh mainstream I guess path that it seems like we're, we're given naturally by how society has evolved does the opposite of all of that. <laughs> does that, do you, I don't know. Is there anything out of what I just said? Does any of that resonate with you? Does any of that make sense <laughs> at all? <laughs> <laughs> I think after, after either of us finishes a, a long thought, we're always ending it with, does that make any I sense know. at all? <laughs> what did I just say? Hopefully someone got something out of that, but No, it does. I mean, just think about an example would be somebody who gets a job at company ABC. And I mean, like I worked I worked at a company where once a year you had to fill out your own like a self-evaluation form to find out if you could if you were worthy of getting a raise or a promotion or anything like that and for someone like me who is trying to tamp down their ego like i'm not comfortable talking about my achievements like i want my achievements just to speak for themselves i'm not going to go around you know a lot of people in my industry currently you know, there's all sorts of awards you can apply for and things. And I don't do that because I don't feel like that's in line with keeping my ego in check, you know. Um, with that being said, while I'm saying that inside my head, my ego right now is like, oh, Dan, you're so awesome because you don't you don't need awards to tell you that you're awesome. <laughs> And then, like, ego, shut up. Yeah, I know. Um, it was really interesting. I talked to someone who had won an award that I was like, oh, congrats. Like, oh, my gosh, how did you get this? And I was just really interested at, at kind of, like, how they got nominated and all these, however this happened. And it's like, oh, yeah, like, the first time I applied. So, first of all, I'm like, wait, you, you apply for this? People don't <laughs> nominate you? They're like, yeah, the first time I applied, I got rejected because I didn't have enough, like, volunteer experience or I didn't I know I wasn't involved in enough community organizations so they went out and you know they they did everything they needed to which they love that stuff in general and you know that that really energizes energizes them and they love it so that's I'm happy for them but that was such a turnoff for me personally because I'm like I'm not okay first of all I don't want to go out and apply for an award and then I don't want to have to have all these check boxes that 
you know, some organization saying, hey, to get this award, you need to do this, this, and this. Go out and do it. Like, yeah. that's not why I want to go out and do things. Like, I just want to do them. And if someone, if there's awards out there and someone wants to say, oh, hey, pat on the back, great job. We want more people to do what you're doing. Okay, that's fine. But yeah, it's so goofy to me when there's this like self-application process of like, prove you're worthy. Like, you know, you need to come come to us and tell us how great you are. It's like, well, that doesn't seem, that seems backwards. <laughs> right. So that was like the first five to seven years of my career. Once a year, I had to like prove my worth for what could end up, you know. So at after like about, I think it was like the third year, I would do my my yearly evaluation. The third year I got smart and I just I saved I saved it was like a word document or something. I just saved it on my laptop and then when the self-evaluation came around the next year I just copied and pasted exactly what I said the year before because I'm like I'm just I'm just trying to be the best person I can and be consistent and if they so if they give me 2% more money this year hooray for me if they don't they don't so so that that comes back to the how does someone who's trying to keep their ego in check function in a world that's set up where ego is sort of rewarded so it's just very challenging because, I mean, if you think about it, like I said, I've never won any awards. I've never applied to win any awards. But a lot of people in my industry do have these awards. The client who is doing an A-B comparison of one my competitor versus me and awards are important to that client, then that other person will get the job and I won't. But I don't know. I just feel like, and I've no, like I said early on in this uh, chat we're having, is that I just found, for me personally, the smaller I made my ego, the better things happened in my life. And so it can be a little scary. Um, like I said, when you're trying to navigate the world where ego seems to be important, but you just sort of have to have trust and faith in the process. And you get these little reminders that, you know what, this is working and don't get scared, you know, because, and I think that's your ego trying to scare you. It's like, oh, this other person has this award and they have this great demo reel and what are you doing your demo reels it's like three years old now and like no one's going to care about that you got to have this and that so it's it's a constant practice i like that no it's a practice i think for a lot of people including myself and this still comes up for me but i think a lot of people it's easy to have the mindset of okay I'm just I'll work on this for a bit get that in check and then I'll be good to go you know or it'll be easier it's like well it doesn't really mean it's easier you know nothing I mean I feel like nothing related to our perspectives and our brains and the the way we work I feel like nothing's permanent I feel like it's something we have to keep practicing otherwise our kind of default mode of of you know being run by our ego I think kind of always comes back around if if we don't continue that practice I think it almost has to because we don't know anything I mean we only know things in the physical world because of our five senses I mean it hap like the moment we're born we're like flooded with all these different data coming in through our sight, smell, sound, touch, taste, all those things. So that's all we know as far as like a physical body. So that's 
the easiest thing to default to because like you know at my age it's so ingrained now like you know and again that's sort of maybe the good part of the ego is that it helps put your hand on the stove when there's a hot burner you know or like there's things you know that you do something once and you get hurt so you don't do it again because that's your ego and your mind telling you like hey remember that time you touched that hot burner don't do that again so yeah it's easy to default to this physical world because that's what's just coming at us all the time through every sense is this is the physical world this is where we live when the the beyond part that i talk about doesn't experience this world the same way that our bodies do so again it's a hard concept to sort of grasp onto so it's not something that we default to quickly yeah that makes sense so where would you suggest anyone listening to this that's like hmm I've never really thought about this much before (laughs) this is something that they're also struggling with Uh, I guess is there kind of a basic place I know you said you can't tie this back to one exact moment or thing you read but is there kind of like a basic place that you feel like people can start to kind of explore this a little bit better on their own? Elise, I'm glad you asked. Good. Did you, uh, have, did you type that up in your... I have uh, seven steps for overcoming ego's hold on you, thanks to Dr. Wayne Dyer. Um, yes, so these are it. sort of his top seven things. Um Number one, try to stop being offended. Don't take things personally. I like yeah. That. Um, number two, let go of your need to win. Now, I think what he means by that is like, if you're playing tennis with someone, you should play tennis just for the sheer joy, number one, of playing tennis and having a body that's capable of doing that and just being appreciative of that, but at the same time, honoring your opponent by trying to play the best you can, but not just because you want to win and like rub it in their face, but you want to be your best so that they can be their best and maybe even working together you can become better together. So that's sort of the way I look at that one. So it's not like you shouldn't try to play tennis with someone. Like number two, like I said, it says let go of your need to win. That doesn't mean don't play tennis. That just means play the tennis, but play it with a different mindset. Um, Then number three on the list is let go of your need to be right. Um, And that's a very egotistical thing because like my default setting is like my ego is in my ear all the time. Just like, Dan, you, you are so smart. You're, you got, (laughs) you got this world all figured out. Can you believe that other person thinks this you know that's wrong. Like so, I think part of that is um, when you let go of your need, your need to be right. You may end up being right from time to time, but you don't need to be right. Um, that helps shrink your ego a little bit, and it also helps with just your your overall happiness, your interaction with other people. You know, if you don't feel like you have to be right all the time, imagine all the conflicts you could avoid. I mean, imagine if our country interacted with other countries without either country feeling like 
they needed to be right or their way was the best way. Um, number four, we're on to number four. Uh, let go of your need to be, to be superior. That sort of ties in with the other stuff. Number five, let go of your need to have more. So to me, that sort of just says like, you don't have to hoard. Like, I guess an example would just be like a, a, a crazy rich person, you know, just through their hard work and working whatever industry they're in, they've accumulated a, you know, a big pile of money or whatever it is. And it's like, um, for a lot of business people, it's all about having more than the other person or having, you know, growing your companies and crushing your competition and things like that. Um, to me, that just doesn't feel right based on listening to the beyond part of myself. Um, number six, let go of identifying yourself on the basis of your achievements. So that sort of goes back to the award thing we were talking about earlier, where, um, and another sort of thing I think about is when people um, start letting outside influences dictate how they feel, then that's a very vulnerable situation you put yourself in because I mean, think about celebrities, you know, uh, everybody loves you one minute and then, you know, TMZ has releases a video of you doing something maybe a little unusual. And then all of a sudden everyone turns on you. And if you let your identity be built by these people, then all of a sudden, you know, you're riding high and then all of a sudden you're crushed because everybody doesn't like you anymore. Um, and then finally, number seven, it says, let go of your reputation. Um, so to me, that sort of just says, you know, you're, the world is sort of an ever-changing place. For some reason, though, human beings like the world to be like stable and constant when it really isn't if you look at it closely. Um, so anything that I've done in the past, any achievements I've done, any good work, any, any bad things I've done. Um, I mean, if I had won some awards in the past and I sort of built myself on that reputation, you know, that's just my, I'm sure my ego would be in my ear, just like, oh, Dan, you're, you're the best, you know, you won that award that looks like a big piece of flame and glass. <laughs> it's like a crystal award. It's really heavy. That means the award is even better when it weighs more. <laughs> so I don't know. Those are the seven things that Dr. Dyer talks about. And I mean, it's in alignment with the way I feel about ego. So maybe some people will get something out of the list. <laughs> yeah, I like the way those are broken down. They each seem on their own, you know, very approachable. And I think even just hearing that list, I know as you were going through, I'm like, oh, yep, I can think of examples of when I did that or when I depended on this. And I think I'm sure everyone listening, there's something coming to mind for them as well. So that definitely seems like a good place to start. I think, I mean, even to simplify it beyond that is like every morning I just sort of wake up and the first thing I think, because I sort of have it on my nightstand next to me, is just like, just try to be the best person you can be today, whatever that means. And I think 
if people are trying their best, that's really all you can ask. We all have different um, abilities. We all have different skills, you know. Um, and if you just use whatever particular skills you have to sort of make our time on this planet a little easier for ourselves and everyone around us, then, I mean, that seems like the right thing to do, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's uh, those are good summarizing thoughts. But before we actually wrap it up, <laughs> was there anything else on the topic of ego that you wanted to touch on or that you think would be important for people to be aware of? I mean, not really. I think we covered most of it. It's just like, it's just, to me, it's just such a fascinating topic. And like you said, and like we've both said, it's hard to put into words, but it's, it's fun to try to share my thoughts and feelings of, around this topic, because I feel like if we put it out there, that then it's out there and then maybe so, someone listening to this podcast will pick up on something that will help them. And it's just this whole ripple effect. Maybe there's sort of, um, I sort of daydream sometimes about uh, a moment of like critical mass where like, if I just keep putting, pumping good stuff out into the universe as the best I can, and there's other people doing the same thing, and then the person next to them keeps doing it, then eventually they'll be it'll hit this tipping point where everything just everyone is just clicking, everything goes into alignment, everybody is being their best selves, their highest selves. And I don't even know what a world like that would look like, but I'm interested to find out. Well, I think we are making a small ripple here, hopefully moving in that direction. <laughs> That's definitely my goal anyway. So thank you, Dan. I really appreciate your time this afternoon. And uh, yeah, I look forward to everyone that's able to listen and, and experience your thoughts because I thought they were awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.